the 2001 EA Sports 500, aka the Talladega race that NASCAR and NBC talks about every single year. Man, look at me helping Jeff. We're going to the front. I'm probably going to push you all the way to the lead, give you a great shot at winning this race. <laughs> I bet that's not how it works <laughs> out. <laughs> I'm just guessing. It was a crazy and near-perfect race. Those who have watched that race, and more specifically that last lap, remember it very well. I guarantee a lot of you can recite Alan Bestwick's last lap call word for word. A lot of interesting stories led up to that race, and just as many stories came from that race. But there is one story you more than likely don't know about that also came from that race. Until now. Whether the reason is simple or complex, everyone has an origin story as to how they became a fan of their favorite driver. In some cases, the reason is simple, like they're from the fan's home state, or they saw them at a local racetrack, or they race for a certain manufacturer, or they race for a certain race team. My story is literally none of those things. However... This is the race that is connected to my own story. So with that being said, this is my story of the 2001 EA Sports 500 and the origin of me becoming a Johnny Benson fan. There were a few notable storylines coming into this race. Ricky Craven had just earned his first win in the Cup Series at Martinsville the previous week over Dale Jarrett. However, that likely only happened as a result of an incident between Kevin Harvick and Bobby Hamilton Sr., where Harvick spun Hamilton Sr., got black flagged one lap for rough driving, and produced this memorable and still relevant quote from Bobby regarding Kevin Harvick. The problem you got here is you got a young kid with a lot of talent trying to fill Dale Earnhardt's shoes and thinks he is Dale Earnhardt and he wouldn't make a scab on Dale Earnhardt's butt right now. He just needs a little more time. This race also featured the final of the No Bull Million Dollar Bonus Races for 2001 as Dale Earnhardt Jr., Dale Jarrett, the aforementioned Kevin Harvick, Ricky Rudd, and Rusty Wallace were the eligible drivers being the top five finishers at the previous Million Dollar Bonus Race at Richmond that fall. However... The biggest headline leading into that weekend was the foundation of the Hans and, back then, Hutchins devices for all of NASCAR's top three series. After two drivers between NASCAR and ARCA died in 2001 as a result of head injuries, this was the weekend that NASCAR decided to mandate them. ARCA encouraged but did not mandate either of the safety devices. However, in that ARCA race at Talladega, Everyone in that race wore one of those devices. For those in NASCAR who hadn't worn either of the devices yet because of various concerns up to that point, some drivers did offer to help out the other drivers, most notably Jeff Green. There was already a bit of hesitancy regarding the race as the final practice session resulted in a wreck where five drivers had to go to backup cars, thus starting in the back of the field. Stacey Compton won the pole for this race, and Bobby Hamilton Sr. was the other front-row starter. Sterling Marlin's attempt to lag back to get a good start to pass Stacey Compton didn't work as Bobby Hamilton Sr. and Johnny Benson both got in line in front of him. Joe Nemechek makes a daring pass for second on lap one, going four wide on Hamilton Sr., Marlin, and Benson. With no drafting help, Hamilton starts going to the back. The silent lap three that both Fox and NBC did throughout 2001 then commenced. Lap five is when we had the first lead change as Sterling Marlin passed Stacey Compton for the lead. During the commercial break, Marlin lost the lead and a plethora of drivers were battling for the lead with Bobby Hamilton Sr. ending up as the leader once the break ended. However, eventually, the inevitable happened on lap 14. And no, I don't mean the big one. Up front... Dale Earnhardt Jr. looking for the lead. You're all, you're all the, clear. Got to bring the stands up to their feet. Dale Earnhardt Jr. took the lead. Shocker, I know. Meanwhile, Sterling Marlin appeared off the pace. Sterling Marlin slowing down. Is he coming to pit road? No. 
He may just be dropping back to the back of the pack. He's done that before. Wasn't that at Daytona? The car wasn't handling well, and he, he got out of the traffic and said, we'll just ride at the back until we get to a pit stop and can fix it. I think you're right, Walt. Meanwhile, Jimmy Spencer did have a problem prompting him to fall out of the race. He was interviewed with an update on Marlin soon after. So Jimmy, an early exit for you. What happened? Uh, just something broke in the top of the motor, I think, you know, like a piston or I really don't know for sure. I mean, it was you just sitting there riding. This isn't racing. You can get up there and race anytime you, you, you call it racing. It, it, it's boring for the drivers. It's scary boring. It's not it's not racing. And uh, it's awful that we have to put up with this, but that's part of it. And unfortunately, we're out of it, so we won't be in the wreck today. I hope there isn't no wreck today, you know. Everybody's using their head right now, so that's pretty good. But uh, something happened in the motor. Uh, Robert Yates has been doing a great job all year long, and it just uh, something happened there, and we, we aren't really sure. Is there anything you can do? You say you hate this kind of racing. It is. I mean, you, that, what can you do? You know, if you want to get up there and lead for a while, you can. And then there's somebody else will shuffle you back because every car out there is equal right now. And they're all running hot because they're so close together. And, you know, if the good Lord blesses us all today and, and everybody uses their head, we won't have an accident. And nobody will get hurt and uh, we'll have a, a winner. But uh, it ain't racing when my, my, not the way I've been born to learn how to race. His last win came here at Talladega. Also, guys, one update on Sterling Marlin. He dropped to the back as a plan. Tony Glover told him if you can't get back up to the front and run with the first through fifth place cars, just drop to the back and let's play it safe like our game plan was already set out. During this entire time, Dale Earnhardt Jr. was leading. For the longest time, nothing really happened as the top four remained the same with Kenny Wallace and Talbotine trading fifth place a bunch of times. That was until the end of the following commercial with the outside line making another charge. One of the inherent problems with restrictor plate racing, and we heard Jimmy Spencer mention it, these cars are so close that they have a tendency to overheat. They can't get any cool air to cool the cars down. That is the case for Jeff Gordon. The oil right now for Gordon, 250. The water, 230. His engine builder, Jay Wilde, says that is the threshold limit right there. We cannot go any higher than that. 240 on the water is the most we want to see. To Bill Weber. And similar problems, uh, Marty, for his teammate, Terry Labonte, overheating in the the engine compartment. Terry has dropped back. Crew Chief Gary Dehart says they will be fine. They just want to put a little bit of tape off the grill. The big problem comes when Terry closes up behind somebody that drives the temperature up. So obviously he's laying back even further off the back of the 40. After the noted concern, Dale Jr. loses the lead for the first time this race to Jason Leffler with the assistance of Todd Bodine. Bodine took the lead from Leffler a few laps later. Leffler did get it back from Bodine, but then Dale Jr. may or may not have hit Leffler in the corner, nearly spinning him. But Leffler saved it, and Jr. got the lead back. After another commercial break, green flag pit stops began. During the last portion of green flag pit stops, things go awry for Kevin Harvick. What happened to Kevin Harvick? Hi, when we were looking at that last pit stop, I could see the 29 on the door. That's not a good thing. I don't know if he had to drive around somebody or... To get in that pit stall? And was there any contact that might have damaged this car? Matt Kenseth was the leader. He's on pit road now. Let's watch Harvick coming to his pit stall. He just locked him up. Just locked up the brakes and the car slid sideways. And that, and that, which sounds like rear brake. Both Yates cars have pitted together. Dale Jarrett around a wedge as he's already down and away, four tires of fuel. Harvick's situation cost him to completely lose the draft and the pack, but would have some interesting circumstances later on. With the pit cycle completed, Matt Kenseth, Dale Jarrett, and Ricky Rudd took the lead, but Bobby Labonte and Michael Waltrip had something to say about that. Also after green flag pit stops, Tony Stewart and Johnny Benson decided to try what I like to call the Pontiac plan. Most notorious with Pontiac drivers back in the day, this was the plan to intentionally ride around in the back during the early and middle portions of the Daytona and Talladega races to avoid any potential wreck. Everything had calmed down with the DEI duo of Dale Earnhardt Jr. and Michael Waltrip still leading the race. Reports of debris came up, but amazingly were debunked by NASCAR. Shocking, I know. However, that did not help Hutch Strickland, 
Ken Schrader, John Andretti, or Jerry Nadeau, who all had their own problems within a few laps. It wasn't looking too well for the million-dollar bonus drivers as DEI's grip on the lead continued, but with Michael Waltrip as the leader. Meanwhile, Bobby Hamilton Sr. was having some overheating issues. Green flag pit stops had begun with Jason Leffler pitting, but as that happened, the first crash of the day happened. Has got one of the ball on the backstretch. Todd Bodine has hit the wall hard on the backstretch. Elliot Sadler and Casey Atwood are in it. Caution's out. A hard crash for Todd Bodine. He was running fourth at the time. And the first yellow flag of the race waves as the field comes to the strike. Harvick not able to get his lap back. He was trying. They're going to check the photo finish camera to be sure. Elliott Sadler and Casey Atwood's cars resting together after their involvement in the accident. Well, BP, no caution free race. Boy, that's good to see. Look at the front end damage to that car. Glad to see Todd Bodine out. See his Hans device there hooked up to the back of his helmet. That was hard, hard contact with the front, with the wall in front of the car. He's pretty spry walking across that racetrack. Kevin Harvick. Kevin Harvick gets in the back of the 66 car and just turns him right in the wall. And there we see the 19. I think the 19 and 21 had probably made contact yeah. back on the straightaway trying to slow down. Yeah, I'm sure there's one guy was waving and one guy didn't get on the brakes quick enough. And they probably got in the back of each other. Let's see if we can see it. Can't grab it by that angle. Uh, I don't get that one. On board with the 14 car of Ron Hornaday, there we see the 66 just going to the right into the wall. And there you see the contact from our Budweiser blimp. It's not an uncommon thing for people to bump each other like that on the straightaway, but well, you got to bump them straight. You can't one. bump them as as the, look, you can see he was at an angle when he hit him. Todd Bodine just walked out, hands his helmet and his Hans device away. Todd, uh, tell us about the incident. Uh, don't really know. It was behind me. You know, I, I really like Kevin Harvick. He's a good kid. He's got a lot of talent. But that's the stu second time that idiot's done that to me. He did it to me at the Bush race at Daytona going in turn one. I was running second, pulled him all the way up from the back. He ran into me, spun me out again there. I uh, did the same thing here. You know, it's a shame. Uh, I tell you, this Kmart Blue Light Special was awesome. Uh, we knew we know the car never qualifies good, but we know it races well, and that's that's the main thing here. And once I got to the front, it was just a matter of drafting, riding around, biding some time, just staying in the right position. Uh, I saw Kevin coming up on the outside, pulling that lane, and so well, if I can get out here and lead a couple more laps, you know, maybe we can get some TV time. But uh, I didn't count on him making a bonehead move. But uh, you know, that's what that's what happens here at Talladega. Uh, you know, the race is so close. Uh, if you get a good run on a guy, the closure rate's so fast, it's really hard to judge sometimes. And uh, evidently, he's not real good at judging it. But uh, we'll be back next week. Are you okay? I'm fine. Look, I'm fine. It's just a little upset. Right. Yep, and he has reason to be, Alan. Kevin Harvick wrecked Talbotine, and somehow Casey Atwood and Elliott Sadler got caught up in it. This ends up being notable because Richard Childress defended his Dale Earnhardt wannabe by saying Ron Hornaday was the reason Kevin Harvick wrecked Talbotine. That's going to be ironic in a few years. And on top of that, something else happened during Harvick's pit stop. Now, Talbotine was not the only person who was a little upset about this incident. During Kevin Harvick's pit stop, let's go ahead and roll the pit stop tape. As Kevin is already in the car, here comes Larry Carter in. He's voicing his opinion to Kevin Harvick about what took place. And Larry Carter is Todd Bodine's crew chief as he exits the pit stop, and he did voice his opinion. Guys? 
<laughs> wow. wow. <laughs> Looked like he kicked the left front tire changer, too. Dale Jr. quickly got the lead from Jason Leffler, and then he and Bobby Labonte traded the lead back and forth multiple times. The Rays had a calming period for a bit before trying to pick back up. Bobby Hamilton Sr. made a charge to the front of the field again and challenged Bobby Labonte for the lead. This, unfortunately, would not be the last time these two would be in an intense duel during this race. As that happened, a debris caution flew. Caution, there's debris on the racetrack. They're coming to the yellow flag. Second one of the race. Oh, round is caution is out. Debris, somewhere. <laughs> and they'll race back to this yellow. There it is. Piece of metal or something off one of the cars. Well, that's that's below the out of bounds. Well, somebody might have hit it from uh, where it originally be. landed on the racetrack and knocked it down. On that round of pit stops, Dale Earnhardt Jr. got the lead back. Bobby Hamilton Sr. challenged Jr. for the lead during this portion of the race. Jr. won out but was then challenged by the Penske tandem of Rusty and Mike Wallace. That challenge was interrupted when Jerry Nadeau had an issue that brought out another caution. At Talladega, we're under caution in the EA Sports 500. Third one of the day, and it happened off of turn four just moments ago involving Jerry Nadeau. All by himself. One car accident. He was back. He was four laps down. There you see him start. The car all by himself, just around it goes. He spins down to bottom of the racetrack, and we did hear radio communication between himself and Tony Furr, and he said something broke. Yeah, on a car turn like that here at Talladega, it's very unusual unless something breaks or... Watch up there on the right-hand side. That car just turned sideways. Whoa. Before that happened, questions of fuel mileage had come into play, but that caution completely eliminated it. The final restart of this race came on lap 156 with Michael Waltrip as the leader. It took a few laps for Dale Earnhardt Jr. to start making his move to the front. Jeff Burton was the beneficiary of that. Eventually, they both took the lead from Michael Waltrip. It was at this moment Michael had a problem develop, which ended up being an overheating issue that had plagued him from earlier. During a commercial break, Dale Jr. took the lead from Jeff Burton. After that, Bobby Hamilton Sr. got the lead from Dale Jr. with the help of Kevin Harvick, of all people. Dale Earnhardt Jr. and Bobby Hamilton Sr. then started trading the lead for a few laps. As that was happening, the Pontiac plan I had referenced earlier started coming into play, with three of them, Johnny Benson, Tony Stewart, and Bobby Labonte, now in the lead pack. In case you didn't know, there were only four total Pontiacs in this race, with Ken Schrader being the other one, who by this point was already a lap down. Dale Earnhardt Jr. and the inside line eventually prevailed for the moment. Hamilton Sr. and Matt Kenseth got side-by-side side to the point Jr., Burden, and Benson could get away for a bit. This ended up being a pattern for a good chunk of the final portion of this race. Kenseth escaped being side-by-side side with Hamilton and joined the front three as Hamilton was now side-by-side side with Tony Stewart. Stewart eventually escaped that as well. Hamilton finally escaped the side-by-side side conundrum getting in between the Gibbs Pontiacs. And then things started to get interesting. Stewart bails back out to the inside. Was he just trying to shake Hamilton and get Bobby up behind him? Could be. If he did, it worked. Now the two Gibbs cars are together. You got two Roush cars up there, Kenseth and Burton. Dale Jr.'s all alone. He lost his drafting partner when Michael Waltrip went out of the race. Kenny Wallace, there in the yellow car, hung back in traffic. Here comes Stewart, outside of Kenseth. And Bobby Labonte quickly jumped on the back bumper of his teammate. Now, if I'm the 99, I'm going to jump out right now, right in front of that 20 car, and let the 20 car push me by the 8 car. Tony Stewart rode around at the back of the pack all race long, hoping to avoid the big wreck. Now, in the final laps, he's on the charge. Racing Benson for third. Now to the outside of Burton for second. Protect the top side. Don't clear up. Don't... Dale Jr. moves to block. 
and Hamilton is in the middle. Is that the spot to be? Bobby Labonte gets hung on the outside. Oh, don't worry. Labonte will be back. But then the 2001 Pepsi 400 nearly reincarnated itself. Stewart with the run to the inside. Inside, inside. he's there. He inside. had the left side wheels down he's on that line. Himself. Did he cross it? Left side the two by two. He may have got run down there too, though. The same exact three. thing that happened at Daytona. Wide. Three wide up front. Coming to five to go. Unlike at Daytona, Tony Stewart was not black flagged. That might have been a huge factor as to how this race ended. Coming to four to go, Bobby Labonte gets the lead from Dale Jr. with the help of Mark Martin. Tony Stewart makes a daring move above the yellow line to get by Dale Jr. At two to go, Jr. splits the Gibbs drivers up. So now we get to the last lap in one of those classic Alan Beswick calls I bet most of you can recite word for word. The white flag is up. Final lap at Talladega. Who's it going to be? Labonte, Earnhardt Jr., Stewart, or maybe somebody out of the pack. Look at this move by Jr. at the white flag. And Tony Stewart got with Jr. Coming with you. 20 is with you. Labonte oh. blocks Bobby Hamilton. I cannot believe it. Oh, no. Contact. Bobby Labonte's over. It's the big wreck on the final lap. They're racing back for the win. Dale Earnhardt Jr. and Tony Stewart are side by side. This is for the victory as Jeff Burton gets in the middle of it. At least 10 cars involved in the wreck of the backstretch. Burton and Stewart are side by side. That's all Earnhardt Jr. needs to see. The big crash happened on the final lap. Racing for the win. Bobby Labonte's car, upside down. Ricky Craven just climbed from his car. Terry Labonte driving back around. Dave Burns. Alan, the 18 crew heard a radio transmission from Bobby Labonte that he was okay. We understand now he is out of his car, so they're going to pick up here. They know Bobby's okay. Yeah, we are looking at him now, Dave. He has climbed from the car. Good news. And one of those wheels are still spinning. And Ricky Craven climbed from his car and just sat down. There you see him sitting on the ground. Wow. Ricky Rudd trying to make it around to the finish line. Dale Jarrett hasn't come around. Robert Presley, Ward Burton, Buckshot Jones, Johnny Benson. And Ricky the other Rudd cars did involved. Not, make it. not gonna make it. Sterling Marlin was involved. That's his car all torn up, going backwards up the pit lane. Robert Preston's car. Bill Elliott was involved. He's coming backwards up the pit lane. There's Dale Jarrett's car. Never made it to the checkered flag. Ward Burton trying to get to the checkers. He's going to make it to the line. And he'll turn around right here. When Dale Jr. passes Bobby Labonte, that caused damage to the back of Labonte's car that Tony Stewart thought would cause Labonte's car to slow down. Hence why he went with Jr. Then Labonte made his two huge mistakes. First, he did what we know today as a douchey bushy block to block Bobby Hamilton Sr. This results in the two Bobbies, Ricky Craven and Johnny Benson, becoming four wide. Then Labonte makes his second mistake doing another douchey bushy block in front of Hamilton Sr. 
when he was not clear of him. Labonte spins himself into Craven, who then hits Benson. Labonte flipped, Craven slid into the wall, and Benson went head-on full speed into the wall, and the big one was on from there. Being in front of all that, Dale Jr., Tony Stewart, and Jeff Burton battled for the win, which Jr. won. Not only did Jr. win the race, but he had also won the No Bull Million Dollar Bonus along with another fan. Craven flops out of his car. Rescue guys are trying to get Bobby Labonte out of his car. Buckshot Jones gets out of the grass to finish the race. Terry Labonte drives his damaged car to the finish line. Ricky Rudd is shown being involved in the wreck as his car expires right before the start-finish line. Sterling Marlin, having completed the race before that, drives up the pit lane backwards with Bill Elliott soon following him. Robert Presley couldn't finish the race. Neither could Dale Jarrett. Ward Burton does make it, and I'm not sure if the crowd was cheering Ward on or if it was for Dale Jr., who was just coming out of turn four, getting ready to celebrate his win. Multiple drivers were interviewed post-race, some excited, but most frustrated for one reason or another. Tony Stewart flat-out refused to be interviewed, supposedly to try and calm down after a frustrating week. Which, this being the Gibbs era of Tony Stewart, I can buy. And thus concludes the story of the 2001 EA Sports 500. But now we get to the part of the story you're probably waiting for. What is the story of me becoming a Johnny Benson fan, and what does the 2001 EA Sports 500 have to do with it? We saw what happened to Johnny. Ricky Craven clobbered him after Bobby Labonte had clobbered Craven. That resulted in Johnny being a part of the beginning of the big one. That crash, though, was only part one of the story. Here's what I mean. See, I had just turned 11 the previous week, and in the past year and a half between NASCAR and ARCA, six drivers died in racing incidents during race weekends, and five of those were because of head injuries. Even at 10 years old, Dale Earnhardt Sr.'s death perplexed me, and I was not an Earnhardt Sr. fan whatsoever, and I'm still not today. However, that was the... If that happened to him, it could happen to anyone moment. I'm sure most of NASCAR felt that way as well. I still remember watching RPM Tonight before one of the New Hampshire race weekends, and the top story one night was Andy Houston's team not being sure if they wanted to run New Hampshire. I still remember thinking... Well, New Hampshire did kill two drivers in 2000, so with Andy's luck this year... That might be a good idea. I had never thought like that before, and Andy was one of my only two drivers back then. I wanted to see him race. But with his luck that year, I didn't want him in danger. So fast forward to the fall Talladega weekend, and I watched the 2001 EA Sports 500. That last lap big one happened. I kind of sort of was rooting for Ricky Craven because he was Andy Houston's teammate that year and he did manage to prove his worth the previous week at Martinsville but I didn't really have a connection to him like I did Andy or my other NASCAR favorite Bill Elliott. I saw Craven get caught up in the big one but I was more focused on Johnny Benson's hit and Bobby Labonte's flip. I saw Labonte out of his car, so I knew he was okay. But amongst all the drivers in that big one, Johnny was the only one who wasn't accounted for. No camera found his car after the wreck had ended, so we didn't see him get out of the car, nor know where his car ended up. His onboard replay was absolutely no help. Not only can you tell the camera actually moved because of the force of the hit, but if you watch it, once Johnny hits the wall, he doesn't move. That was a bit freaky. Then amongst all the drivers interviewed, Johnny was the absolute last driver interviewed in that entire broadcast. And honestly... Well, I was happy he was at the very least conscience. He looked a bit out of it. Well, watch for yourself. 
One of the drivers involved in the wreck was Johnny Benson, who was running for a top five spot at the time. Moments ago, Dave Burns spoke with him. Walk from the infield care center. Johnny, what in the world was that like? I, I don't even know what happened. I mean, we're sitting there running third, looking like it would be a top five finish here, you know, and we actually started to pull away down the back stretch and uh, running good. Jared's Pontiac was good all day long, just uh, taking the time, waiting for the last lap deal, you know, and uh, we're sitting in pretty good shape. and. Heck, next thing I know, I'm heading straight into the wall. I mean, I haven't, I haven't seen anything. Don't know what happened. Didn't even see anybody beside me. Or I knew somebody was behind me. And like I say, next thing I know, I'm, I'm going the wrong way. So, I, I, I hate it. The guy said, "That's a brand new race car. Probably had four or five hundred hours into this car. Qualified good. Looked like it was going to run good. And I, I just, just feel pretty sick to your stomach over something like that, especially on the last lap. Everybody been good all day long, and, and then have to. I, there again, I don't know what happened." It was a great day for him until everything broke loose. Besides his initial hit into the wall, I counted five times Benson got hit by other cars in that wreck. It was not pretty, that's for sure. I may or may not have misinterpreted that he was sick in this race, but I blame that on me being 11. Years later in 2022, I found out my concerns were justified. As Johnny said in an interview on the Scene Vault podcast that he had his own concerns when he got hit by Ricky Craven. In addition to that, remember when I referenced the Hans device mandation? It turned out that came into play regarding this wreck. And there is a bit of irony on who helped Johnny out in that regard. You know, the Hans has been out forever, and I remember Kyle Petty using it, and it was such a a massive piece that they think at that point in time and people are uncomfortable getting in and out of the car. So whoever made that next step with being able to get it to the size that people could use it for and utilize it. I remember the first day I used it. Um, we were at Talladega and got hit and I got turned uh, going into three and I'm going to head on into the wall with it. And I was, that's the first time in a race car I go, this might hurt because it, you, you know, the, we're running at the bottom it's going to take you a couple of seconds to get there. Normally, you get a fraction of a second before you hit. Yeah. This three seconds is a very long time. And I remember, I go, this is really going to hurt. And I remember hitting the wall. I remember coming off the wall going, oh, my God, that wasn't so bad. Well, the next seven guys that hit me probably wasn't so good. But I just remember that first impact, and I've never gotten a car without that again, ever. ever. When did you – when when was that? What? Well, that would uh, – kind of when I first – it would have been in it. It had to have been in two thousands, I think, when they. Okay. Right. Um, I think when they started running. I remember it was with ten cars. So it'd be, it might have been right at that. Okay. You know what I mean? They yeah. they had the Hutchins device yeah, and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's the first time that I was able to get a Hans, and Bob Lebani was the one that was adamant coming down there. She need to get one. I says I can't find one that fits. And uh, then he gave me the direct number to somebody, and I got one for that weekend. And that was, that was the day that I needed it. Either way, his part of that big one, the onboard replay scare, and his interview is only part one of the story as to how I became a fan of his. Now, as for part two of the story, I believe this was the following Friday, but it might have been the Friday after that. My mom and I go to a local Walmart to get things at Walmart that you can only get at Walmart during that time. And being 11 years old, you do what any 11-year-old does. You go to the toy aisle. Back in 2001, NASCAR was so huge that there was an entire wall of NASCAR merch. With nearly all of it being die-casts. It wasn't that one dinky sector that was part of the wall that it is today. Amongst that plethora of die-casts was this 164 scale Eagle One Number 10 Johnny Benson Pontiac which I still have today. It came with this card, which I also still have today. I picked up that item remembering him from that crash at Talladega. And what happened next took me years to come up with a way to properly explain what exactly happened next. When I picked up that item, I looked at him. Now, Spoiler alert if you have never seen the original Men in Black movie. If you remember that scene where the lady mortician finds a cat, and this cat has a collar on it that is holding a marble, and this marble contained a galaxy, 
like the Milky Way, the Lady Mortician just gets this overwhelming feeling looking at this galaxy. That is what happened to me when I looked at Johnny on that card that came with this diecast. To this day, I still have no idea what exactly happened or even why that happened. And that's the best way I can describe what happened even after all these years. But that's literally what happened. As a result, I convinced myself to get that die cast and the card that came with it. And I've been a Johnny Benson fan ever since. So, between probably the most famous last lap big one in NASCAR history, where for the longest time we had no idea if Johnny was even okay, and some supernatural experience between 11-year-old me and a trading card that came with a die cast, that is the story of how the 2001 EA Sports 500 was the catalyst to me becoming a Johnny Benson fan.